formed from lush plants that grew on the earth over 300 million years ago. After being buried underground and squeezed harder and harder, the plants became the rocky black substance we call coal. Hi, I'm Barb, and together we're going to explore the world of coal in Kentucky. This video series will help us all understand what coal is and what it means for Kentucky. In this first part, we'll learn what coal is and why it's found in Kentucky. We'll travel to coal mines all over the state and learn how mined land is put to new uses. So hold on to your hard hats. Here we go. Coal is important because it makes a lot of heat when we burn it. Because coal burns well, America needs it so our industries can do more. Coal was first used by Native Americans well before Europeans arrived, but Kentuckians have been using coal for over 200 years. On April 13, 1750, Dr. Thomas Walker found coal in Kentucky, and within 70 years, coal mines were opening up throughout the huge coal fields in East and West Kentucky. Early in the 1800s, blacksmiths used coal to make all sorts of things, such as metal tools and wagon wheels. And soon, trains were chugging throughout the country, pulled by coal-fired steam locomotives. Coal is baked in hot furnaces to make coke, which is used to make steel from iron ore. In the early 1900s, coal was being used to make electricity that powered things like electric streetlights. However, oil was still used to make most of America's electricity for our homes, businesses, and schools. But in the 1970s, we couldn't buy oil from the Middle East, so oil and gas prices went way up. This made coal even more important for making electricity. As the need for coal increased, Kentucky became the number one coal-producing state in the country. But you may be asking, how does coal really affect my life? We all use a lot of electricity, and we can make electricity by burning a fuel such as oil, natural gas, or coal. Coal has many advantages over these other sources of energy. Abundant. The United States produces one quarter of the world's coal, second only to China, and many U.S. coal beds are close to the Earth's surface, which make them easy to mine. There are over 400 billion tons of coal we can mine with today's technology, and there are nearly 4 trillion tons in the ground that we may be able to mine with future technology. That's enough to last us a very long time. Useful. Coal is used as a fuel to make more than half of all the electricity used in the United States. It's also used to make steel, cement, paper, and other products. A good alternative. Greater use of coal means we don't have to rely so much on other countries for the energy we need every day. Jobs. Coal is a homegrown industry that many towns depend on for jobs. And as new technologies are invented, people who know how to use the tools will be needed. Computers, math, and science are more important than ever in the coal industry. So you see, by knowing more about coal, you can help make important energy decisions for yourself, your state, and your country. In a very simple way, the coal is a rock that burns. And the main types of fossil fuels are oil, and natural gas, and coal. And all that means is that they are fuels that come from fossil living remains. So plants, having once been alive, become fossilized. Their organic matter is what we burn as a fuel, and coal is one of those types. And I have some of those examples right here. These ferns uh, lived in the swamp 310 to 320 million years ago. And they settled down in the mud, and their imprints uh, were left in the mud as a fossil. These look kind of like flowers, but they're really leaves on a stem. And it was something that looked like this. Here's the stem, and then these are the leaves coming off the stem. 
here's how coal was formed. More than 300 million years ago, plants grew in swampy forests that covered many parts of the earth. In Kentucky, these swamps covered what is now the eastern and western parts of the state, as well as many surrounding states. The plants grew and absorbed the sun's energy. As the plants died and fell into the swamp, new ones grew in their place. And when these died, still others grew. Well, as the years went by, a thick layer of dead plants accumulated at the bottom of the swamp to form a spongy brownish material called peat. And this is a piece of peat. It's very soft and crumbly. You can still see some of the plant remains in the peat. As sea levels changed and rivers flooded, sediment covered the peat. As layer upon layer of sand, mud, and clay piled up, the peat was further compressed by pressure and heat, squeezing out most of the water. As if in an oven, layers of peat were cooked until after millions of years, they hardened to what we call coal. Plant material has a lot of carbon in it. It's an organic material, just like anything. And when we heat that plant material, it, the carbon uh, turns black. And the same thing if you heat wood in a fire, you take a piece of wood, burn it, it'll turn black. There are four major types of coal that are classified by hardness. The harder the coal, the less moisture it contains, and the hotter it burns. We have the next one here. It's a piece of sub-bituminous coal. And there's still some little brown and yellow flecks in there, but you can see it's starting to get shiny. And this is the coal we have in Kentucky. It's called bituminous coal. You can see it's very shiny, and there's many layers in it. And then the last stage for coal, when it's heated under intense pressure, would be anthracite coal. And you can see it's very shiny, and it's very hard. Uh, the hardness comes from the pressure, and that you're continually putting these things under more and more pressure as you bury them through time. Today, coal is found in 38 different states. But we're here to learn why coal is found in Kentucky. We know what the rocks look like at the surface, but we want to know now what they look like underground to help explain why the coal is where it is. So imagine we take a knife and we cut through Kentucky, and we look at how the rocks are layered beneath the surface. And what we can see is this gray area here, the Western Kentucky coal field, uh, places like uh, Hopkins County, Webster County, Henderson County. The gray occurs in a bowl here, gray rocks. That's the rock that has coal in it. And all of the rocks kind of dip in that area. It's what we call the Illinois Basin. We go towards the east into central Kentucky, Fayette County, uh, Jefferson County, and we see that we don't have that gray rock anymore. It's gone. It's been eroded. And the older rocks, these purple rocks, are pushed up to the surface. We go back into eastern Kentucky, counties like Breathitt and Knott, Perry, Pike County, and we get the gray again. That's the coal-bearing rocks. And that's called the Eastern Kentucky Coal Field. It sits in another depression that we call the Appalachian Basin. So basically, we have two bowls that filled up with coal-bearing rocks. And then we have an area in the center of the state, which we call an arch, where the rocks have been eroded. In East Kentucky, coal is found in a 37-county area. In West Kentucky, coal is found in a 19-county region. Kentucky coal seams run from 2 feet to 8 feet thick, and the distance underground varies widely. Bituminous coal basically means that's the rank of coal, the rank of the plant material, how hot it's been heated, how much time it's been underground, how much pressure it's uh, gone under. The coal in Kentucky has been in the ground for 300 million years. It was buried by thousands of feet, if not miles, of sediment. And that has been eroded. And all that pressure and time heated it to the point where it is now bituminous coal. Kentucky still has a lot of coal in the ground, over 91 billion tons. And only 14% of Kentucky's coal has been mined over the last 170 years. I bet you're wondering how we get coal out of the ground. Well, it's not easy, and it takes a long time. In the earliest mines, coal could only be taken from seams close at the surface. Mining had to follow the coal bed underground where it was mined by hand. Mules, horses, oxen, and even goats were used to haul coal out of these early mines. 
Eventually, machines made mining easier and faster, and electric trains replaced our animal friends. There are two basic ways to mine coal, underground and surface mining. Underground mining is used when the coal is deep below the surface or in hilly land like East Kentucky. In Kentucky, underground mines are either drift, slope, or shaft mines. Drift mining is used to reach coal that's located in a hillside. The entrance is usually where the coal is seen on a hillside and a horizontal tunnel is cut in through the coal. A second entrance is made to allow air to ventilate or flow through the mine. Miners get into the mine by riding a man trip. These allow many miners and their equipment to ride to where they need to work, which in some mines can be six miles from the entrance. This man trip has rubber tires. Slope mining is similar, but the entry is slanted and everything moves in and out of the mine through the slope shaft. Additional entrances are made to ventilate the mine with fresh air. A man trip is also used in a slope mine. This one travels on a rail. A shaft mine reaches the coal through two openings down into the coal bed. Two elevator shafts provide vertical access to the coal bed. One shaft is used to transport workers and equipment, and the other is used to send coal to the surface. Most mines have an area nearby where the coal is cleaned and sorted. For many mines, this processing area is located just outside the mine entrance. But for others, the coal must be moved to the processing area by truck. Most underground mines use a room and pillar system. The miners take out the coal by cutting a series of rooms into the coal bed and leaving pillars or columns of coal to support the mine roof. As mining advances, a grid-like pattern forms in the coal bed. The grid can be 400 feet wide and more than half a mile long. In a single mine, several room and pillar areas may be going on at one time, all connecting to the access tunnel. When as much coal as possible is removed, the area is abandoned. The pillars can be left to prevent the land above the mine from collapsing. Generally, with a room and pillar mine, a little more than half of the coal is taken out because the pillars are left in place. In most mining, a big machine cuts the coal from the seam. This is called a continuous miner. The continuous miner has many safety features that make this type of mining safe and productive. First, the operator uses a controller so they can stay a safe distance from the cutter as the coal is broken away from the seam. Water spray helps keep the coal dust from flying all over and like a vacuum cleaner in reverse, the continuous miner blows air away from the cutting area so any other dust is blown away from the miners. The machine has sensors that monitor methane, which is an invisible gas that's mixed with coal. Currently, there is no way to separate the methane from the coal as the coal is cut from the seam. And if it builds up, the methane can explode. The continuous miner automatically warns the miners if the methane level gets too high. As the coal is broken loose, shuttle cars move in behind the continuous miner and the coal is pushed right into them. The miner then drives the shuttle car to the conveyor, where the coal is unloaded. Here, the coal is sprayed with water to control the dust. A long conveyor belt then takes the coal all the way out of the mine to the processing area. As areas are mined, roof bolts are placed in the ceiling with a special machine. The person drills a deep hole in the roof. A long bolt is pushed into the hole with a tube of sticky resin slid around it. The resin attaches itself to the bolt and rock, securing the roof bolt in place. This keeps the roof from falling. Long wall mining is another underground mining method where robots and computers are used in coal mines. A long wall miner is a huge computerized machine that cuts into a long coal seam. This radio controlled robotic cutter moves back and forth across a long section of the coal seam. In some mines, this wall can be 800 feet wide. The coal is cut by a huge whirling blade and travels out of the mine on a flexible conveyor. This shearer has a large drum-shaped cutting head that strips 20 to 36 inches from the coal face on each pass. It rides a special track on the conveyor. 
Long wall mining is done under movable hydraulic roof supports, or shields, that automatically move forward as the coal face is cut. The supports protect the miners and machines from roof falls. The roof in the mined out area is allowed to fall in behind the long wall machine, forming an area of broken rock called gob. Shuttle cars aren't needed, so moving the coal out is easier and faster, and a lot more coal can be mined since no pillars are left in place. So you see, underground mining is very complex and has a lot of high-tech machines that make it possible. But safety and training are important parts of any coal mine. In an underground mine, the workers must have fresh air. This is why there are always at least two openings. Miners regularly check the air quality to be sure fresh air is flowing into the mine. Every 20 minutes, miners test the air for methane to be sure this gas isn't building up to dangerous levels. Coal dust can make it hard to breathe. To reduce the amount of coal dust, powdered limestone, called rock dust, is spread all over and water is sprayed on the coal as it's cut from the face. Every miner wears a self-rescuer in case of an emergency. Others are located throughout the mine where everyone can find them. In all mining, safety is a primary concern. The roof must be supported properly, air ventilation systems must work correctly, and electricity must be available in all parts of an active mine in order to give good lighting and keep the miners safe and able to work. And all this is done right because of careful planning that's done before any mining begins. Surface mining is used when coal is found close to the surface. Over 40% of all Kentucky coal is mined in surface mines. In West Kentucky, one method of surface mining uses a drag line. These giants are the largest land-based machines in the world. Drag lines are very expensive and run on electricity. What they do is uncover earth and rock over the coal. This is called overburden. At a surface mine, the topsoil is set aside or goes into other mined areas. Next, the overburden is broken into manageable sizes, usually with explosives that blast the overburden free. The coal is then removed and loaded onto trucks and taken to a processing plant. A second surface method is called contour mining and is used in the steep hills of East Kentucky. Contour mining starts at the edge of a hill and continues into the mountain until the overburden becomes too thick. This temporarily produces a high wall until it's filled back in. Once the overburden becomes too great, the coal may be removed with an auger, which drills into the mountain. As the coal is cut free, it's pulled out of the mine along the auger itself. The coal is then loaded into trucks and taken to the processing plant. Many coal seams are close enough to the surface so that the entire mountaintop is removed. This mountaintop removal is sometimes used in the eastern Kentucky coal field. At both underground and surface mines, a processing plant and transportation area are nearby. At the processing plant, coal is crushed, sorted, and washed. Crushing and sorting separate the coal from any rock mixed in with the coal. This rock is then returned to the reclamation site. Cleaning removes most of the stuff that cannot be burned. After processing, the coal is shipped to the customer by truck, railroad, or river barge. So our big job then is to work with the producer of the coal and with the ultimate user, usually a utility or a big industry that uses coal for their power, and coordinate with them the movement of the product to get it from the coal mine to the ultimate user on the schedule that the ultimate receiver needs it delivered there. We have dispatch people. Uh, their jobs are primarily to coordinate the shipments of coal into the terminal uh, from, from the mine origin onto the rail car uh, from a truck going into our facility, whether we take that coal directly to a barge or to a stockpile. They coordinate and interface with barge companies railroads, producers, uh, analytical labs, and users like utilities. 
Today, mining coal takes time and money and people who know what they're doing. First, the coal must be found. We have records down through the ground that show where the different layers of rocks are underneath the surface. And when we find a coal bed, we, know, we try to figure out which coal bed that is. And so we can tell you exactly underneath the ground at any spot what coal beds are there, what aren't there. Basically becomes, again, a game of connecting the dots. You know where it is at one spot, you know where it is at another spot, and then you use geology and a little bit of science and a little bit of guesswork sometimes to figure out where it should be. Geologists determine the quality of the coal and the rock around it. Most people don't know it, but coal is, has different qualities. Uh, the majority of the uh, utilities look for the parameters of moisture, which is how wet it is, and uh, ash, which is how much ash content it has, what doesn't burn. BTUs, um, a lot of uh, people can't quite understand a BTU, which is the heating value, so I oftentimes explain it to them as calories, which is the same thing. And uh, sulfur content, and of course, and of course with the, uh, EPA concerns and environmental concerns, sulfur is a, a, a big, important factor right now. Second, because mining affects so many things, it can take two years or more of planning before the mining actually begins. Detailed plans for mining, for safety and ventilation, for protecting the environment, and for what to do with the land after mining must be approved before mining starts. One of the most important parts of coal mining is what to do with the land after the coal is taken out. This is called reclamation. Reclamation starts with planning well before mining can begin. In the pre-planning, what we do is we go out and we actually do surveys. We take samples uh, of the uh, water before the mining begins, the wells, people's wells in the area, and also the streams. Also, we do some biological assessments. We actually go out and count the bugs, count the trees, uh, identify them, and to make sure what's there and monitor them as we go along to make sure that the mining industry isn't damaging any of the uh, plant life, invertebrates, fish, that type of thing that's in the stream. Today, with more information, new technology, and improved science, we can protect the land. After successful reclamation, it can be hard to tell which land has been mined and which hasn't. In fact, the restored land may be more useful than before. At a surface mine, as the coal is removed, reclamation immediately follows, according to the plan set up before mining started. There are different kinds of soils that you're going to produce from the rock that you're going to disturb. Maybe you have a lot of sand versus a lot of clay or a lot of mud. That can help you plan what type of plants you're going to seed, for instance, in a surface mine afterwards. Water quality is constantly checked to protect water supplies and reduce pollution. The overburden is pushed back into the mine with giant bulldozers, then contoured for water drainage and to blend with the landscape. The topsoil is prepared for planting, and the reclaimed land is managed for many years. We think we're a, a good citizen, just like farmers, in, uh, using the land and putting it back for future uses. So, what happens after the coal is mined and the land is reclaimed? If the reclaimed land becomes a lake or reservoir, water can be stored, benefiting plant and animal life. Mined land can be turned into forests, pasture land, or lake country for hunting, fishing, and camping. Proper care can turn steep, hilly land into space for new uses. But the problem we have here is uh, certainly everything lies between mountains. And, uh, you know, if you look from one mountain to the other, uh, you can almost throw a rock across most of this. Uh, they cut back into the rock to get the cold off. Now, when they do that, then there is a large flat area made because of that. In a situation like this, they allow us to, le uh, to leave it this way so that we can get the flat area. Uh, we felt like we really got a good deal in the end, and probably no one would have ever thought of putting it here if it hadn't already been partially fixed for us. The people of Kentucky are able to use the level land for everything from airports to schools, all because of proper reclamation. Coal is an important part of America's future, and we all must know as much as we can about it in order to improve how we use our natural resources and have good jobs in the future. 
This video series showed what coal is and how it's mined in Kentucky. In the next part, we'll explore how we use coal to make electricity. If you want to learn more about Kentucky's power source, check out the companion interactive CD-ROM that you can use on your computer. Travel deep into a mine and find out how the coal got there and how we use it to make electricity, as well as new technologies that are making coal more useful and clean burning. Order your CD-ROM today by calling the number on your screen. formed from lush plants that grew on the earth over 300 million years ago. After being buried underground and squeezed harder and harder, the plants became the rocky black substance we call coal. Welcome back to Coal, Kentucky's power source. I'm Barb, and together we're going to explore the world of coal in Kentucky. In this second part, we'll learn how we use coal every day. So hold on to your hard hats, here we go. The coal in Kentucky has been in the ground for 300 million years. Computers have made such great strides that it's hard to imagine really how fast that's going to go and where it's going to go. I'm finding ways to do other things with coal that would be beneficial to people. Coal is important because it makes a lot of heat when we burn it. Blacksmiths used coal to shape metal into all sorts of things. With the invention of the steam engine, coal became a necessary part of the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s. Trains, ships, and manufacturing plants used steam-powered engines to operate. 
Inside a steam engine, water is heated so hot that it turns into steam. The steam pressure increases until there's enough force to turn a turbine, which is like an airplane propeller. This turbine then turns a set of gears, which makes a train or ship move. Coal is used to heat the water until it becomes steam. Today, industries of all sorts use coal's heat to do many things. Coal is also used to make plastics, fertilizers, and medicines. Concrete and paper plants also burn large amounts of coal. Coal is baked in hot furnaces to make coke, which is used to make steel from iron ore. Carbon makes steel stronger, so we can build bridges, skyscrapers, and automobiles. Not all coal produced in Kentucky is used in the United States. Since we have so much coal, we sell lots of it to other countries in Europe, Asia, and South America. But coal's largest use is in making electric power. There's a lot of coal out there in the ground uh, that can be used and extracted or taken out of the ground very easily. Uh, and that makes the cost of electricity fairly low in our state. Coal is used to make electricity for many reasons. First, coal burns very hot and can turn water into steam. Second, we have a lot of coal in the U.S. Third, American coal is cheaper than using oil from other countries. Until there's a new way to make electricity, and as long as we continually to increase our use of electricity, the next 10, 20, 50 years, unless something changes, we're going to be mining coal or longer. We use electricity for so many things that electric utility companies expect to use more coal as they need to make more electricity. Over 80% of all coal mined in the U.S. is used for making electricity, and 95% of Kentucky's electricity comes from power plants that use coal. In order to use coal to make electricity, we have to get the coal from the mine to the customer, such as an electric power plant, and this is done in many ways. Kentucky sells a lot more coal to neighboring states than it receives from them. And most Kentucky coal is moved from the mine to the customer in more than one way. It depends on the distance and how much it costs to get there. Kentucky coal is hauled out of the mine with shuttle cars and conveyor belts. The coal is moved to the processing plant where the coal is washed. This is usually done near the mine. Trucks and conveyor belts take the coal to this prep area. Then the coal is put in rail cars, trucks, barges, ships, or conveyor belts and sent to the customer. Coal in Kentucky mostly travels by train to the customers. In Kentucky, there are over 2,700 miles of railroad lines with over 100,000 rail cars dedicated to coal transportation. Unit trains move most Kentucky coal. These have 100 or more cars that are loaded and unloaded automatically at dispatch centers. Coal makes up about half of the railroad's freight business so that coal miners and people who work on the railroad depend on each other. Travel by river barge is another way coal is moved from a mine to the customer. Millions of tons of Kentucky coal float down thousands of miles of rivers every year. The only limiting factors are going to be uh, you know, conditions on the river, uh, things like railroad car availability to get, to get coal to the river and then transfer it to barges, and ultimately the plants themselves. Of course, to move Kentucky coal around the world, huge coal freighters called colliers are filled with coal at ports along the Atlantic Ocean and other coastlines. During its journey from a mine to the customer, most of Kentucky's coal travels at least part of the way by truck. Trucks are an important part of the coal business and create jobs for people, some of whom drive their own trucks and run their own businesses. So transportation uh, provides not only a lot of jobs, but is a big part in the delivery cost of coal. Kentucky coal goes to electric power plants throughout the United States. In fact, there are 20 major coal-burning electric utility plants in Kentucky alone. But how do we make electricity from coal?
like the steam engine, making electricity from coal is a simple idea, but it takes big machines and people who know how to work them to do it right. Once the coal arrives at a power plant, it is crushed into a fine powder. As it passes into the furnace, the powder is mixed with hot air to help it burn better. The coal mixture enters the furnace where it burns at over 2,700 degrees. A boiler filled with water is heated by the burning coal. As it heats, the water turns to steam, creating pressure, just like a kettle on a stove. The steam leaves the boiler and passes over a turbine, making the turbine spin faster and faster. A turbine is a shaft with blades, much like propellers on a plane. The steam rushes over the blades, causing the shaft to spin. The spinning turbine turns a generator, which is made up of a large magnet surrounded by a wire coil. Well, as the magnet turns inside the wire coil, electric current is created. The electricity is carried away or conducted through heavy cables and eventually reaches your home and school. A condenser cools the steam, changing it once again into water. This water returns to the boiler and the cycle is repeated. Burning coal produces ash, which is simply the rock material in coal that won't burn. This ash can fly into the air, just like when you burn wood for campfire. Ash can be reduced by cleaning the coal at the preparation plant. Here, coal comes in from the mine and is sized and sorted. Much of the rock material is cleaned out of the coal with water. The coal is then shipped to the power plant. When coal is burned at the power plant, the ash, which couldn't be cleaned, is prevented from flying into the air by special devices that trap this fly ash. At some power plants, Smoke passes through an electrostatic precipitator, or EP, that uses electrical charges to remove tiny pieces of ash from the smoke. Burning coal also gives off sulfur dioxide, and because of concern about acid rain, there are very strong restrictions on the amount of sulfur dioxide that a power plant can release into the atmosphere. Sulfur dioxide can be reduced in three ways. First, burn coal that creates less sulfur dioxide. Second, use scrubbers to remove the sulfur dioxide from the air that passes out through the smokestack. In many plants, scrubbers clean the air, much like a dishwasher, by spraying a fine mixture of water and limestone into the gases before they go up the smokestack. The limestone contains a chemical which combines with the sulfur dioxide to form a harmless wet material that can be dried and used to make other useful products. Third, convert the coal into a gas. Many new power plants will use this coal gas to make steam and produce electricity. Before the gas is burned, the pollutants are removed to make the coal gas burn as clean as natural gas. Also, these high-tech power plants are so efficient that they actually use less coal to produce electricity. By burning less coal, less carbon dioxide is put into the air, so you see, at each step, new ways are being found to burn cleaner coal so we can keep our air clean. We use coal every day to make electricity so we can see in the dark, watch television and play on our computer. But it doesn't stop there. We're also finding new ways to use what's left over after the coal is burned. These are called byproducts. Road material is made from the stuff found inside scrubbers. Fly ash is used to make golf balls, bowling balls, tennis rackets, tool handles, fiberglass for cars and charcoal for grilling out in the summer. Coal byproducts are used in car parts, protective coatings, on cookware, and paint filler that makes paint hard to scratch. With all these uses for coal, you might wonder how coal affects Kentucky's economy. With two huge coal fields, Kentucky's coal industry is going strong. Kentucky is one of the top three coal producing states behind Wyoming and West Virginia. In 1994, Eastern Kentucky mines produced over 130 million tons, while Western Kentucky mines produced over 38 million tons. Coal industry is our heart. 
a lot of people uh, look at it negatively, but it is not a negative thing. Certainly, it's the most positive thing in Eastern Kentucky. We couldn't do without it. You know, that's, that's our lifeblood, cold, cold is. During 1994, $3.3 billion was brought into Kentucky from coal sales to other states and foreign countries. With, you know, the heating and the air conditioning and, and the computers and everything that we enjoy uh, comes because that we have a low-cost fuel in coal that produces electricity that we have to have uh, for Kentucky to, uh, to operate on. Coal mining directly employs about 24,000 people and also provides 71,000 jobs that relate to coal, such as truck drivers and electric utility technicians. The coal industry pays all sorts of state taxes, which help pay for schools, roads, and state parks. Coal is an important part of Kentucky, and we all must know as much as we can about it in order to improve how we use our natural resources and have good jobs in the future. This video showed you how we use coal every day and how important coal is to the future of Kentucky. In the next part, we'll learn about new technologies being used in the coal industry and what the future might hold for you if you're looking for work in the coal or electric utility industries. So come on back for part three of Coal, Kentucky's Power Source. If you want to learn more about Kentucky's Power Source, check out the companion interactive CD-ROM that you can use on your computer travel deep into a mine and find out how the coal got there and how we use it to make electricity as well as new technologies that are making coal more useful and clean burning. Order your CD-ROM today by calling the number on your screen. was formed from lush plants that grew on the earth 300 million years ago. After being buried underground and squeezed harder and harder, the plants became the rocky black substance we call coal. Welcome back to Coal, Kentucky's power source. 
I'm Barb, and together we'll explore the world of coal in Kentucky. This video series will help us all understand what coal is and what it means for Kentucky. In this third and final part, we'll learn about the many careers related to coal, as well as new technologies used in the coal industry. So hold on to your hard hats. Here we go. In a very simple way, the coal is a rock that burns. As long as we continue to use electricity and there's no other means of producing it, but there's going to be coal mining in East Kentucky. There's never been a day that I've worked in this industry that I haven't learned something. When you think of coal mining, you may picture a dirty, dark place where men pick away at the walls and haul the coal out on little trains. Not anymore. Today, coal mining is a high-tech industry full of computers, robotics, and scientists. The biggest use of coal is to make electricity that we depend on to run our TVs, refrigerators, and microwaves. Coal is an important part of all of our lives. Coal is one of the fossil fuels along with natural gas and petroleum. We derive most of our energy from fossil fuels. Uh, about 80% of this coal is used in uh, power generation, so it, it is a major player in the production of electricity that we've come to depend on in this country. A coal mine doesn't just happen. Someone has to decide they want to start a coal mine. This person is the owner of a mine. We're entrepreneurs. We're just about like uh, any other small business. If I was in the sixth grade and I was mowing lawns for folks in my neighborhood, I've got to have lawns to mow, and I've got to have people that pay me to mow the lawn. And because we're located in eastern Kentucky, uh, we mine coal. After the owner has the land, they must find the coal and figure out the quality of the coal. That's where a geologist comes in. When someone decides they're gonna try and mine underground, one of the first things they have to do is drill holes beneath the ground to see where the coal is and what the rock around the coal would be like. And what you're looking at right here, this is actual rock core is what we call it. And what we look at then is we can see the actual rocks. You can see some coal. Here's a very thin coal. Here's another very thin coal. You know the thickness of the coal bed. And from the, you do this at one point, then you may go to another point. You may have a surface outcrop somewhere, especially in eastern Kentucky where we have a lot of mountains, and you try to connect basically the points. You have a piece of data at each point, and you have to infer using science and sometimes a little bit of guesswork what the conditions of that coal bed, the roof rock, the floor rock will be based on these uh, samples. The core samples are studied in labs throughout the state. Some are private companies like this one, which has labs in both east and west Kentucky. In this particular lab, we have chemists, we have biologists, we have environmental biologists, uh, which do the field work. Uh, we have some people with uh, engineering backgrounds. But others, like this one at Western Kentucky University, are run by state universities. Most of the people that have worked in this laboratory over the years have been chemists, but we also have chemical engineers. We have biologists, physicists, mathematicians, and industrial technology people that uh, would like to get some uh, experiments working with fossil fuels. There are four major things that everyone wants to know about the coal. First, how much moisture is in the coal? The less moisture, the better the coal burns. It's just like trying to start a fire with a wet piece of wood. Dry wood burns better and so does drier coal. Second, how much ash is in the coal? Ash is the stuff left over when you burn something. It's the rocky material that's in the coal. The less ash, the better the coal. Third, how hot can the coal burn? This is measured as BTU for British thermal units. It tells how hot something burns. 
Fourth, how much sulfur is in the coal? As we've seen, sulfur is released in a gas, sulfur dioxide, when coal is burned. The less sulfur, the better the coal. The utilities don't want to carry out those big piles of ash either. They want as little as possible. They want the most heating value they can get. And they want it as dry as they can get it. And they want it as low as sulfur as they can get it. Knowing these four facts lets the mine owner and someone buying coal, such as a power plant, know how good the coal is. Now, not all coal, even in Kentucky, has the same quality, and this affects how much the coal costs. Of course, coal is bought and sold according to the quality of the coal. How quality coals sell for more than the lower quality coals, the lower the ash, the more money you, you get. The utility companies, a lot of times, especially with uh, an electric company, for example, they will buy large volumes of coal, and before buying this coal, they would like to know if the coal is going to burn efficiently, and the laboratory can help them uh, find ways to resolve some of the problems with environmental problems as well. A computer is a great tool to use when studying coal. For every instrument we probably will buy for this laboratory, we'll have a computer to control the instrument. This allows a lot of data collection in a very short period of time, reduces um, analysis time, uh, collects more data quickly so that we can get results to people that need it, to researchers that need information, sometimes in order of minutes after we've collected samples. Just about everyone in the lab can use a computer very efficiently. After the coal is found, plans are made for how best to get it out of the ground and how to make the mined area as good or better than before. Surveyors measure the land in order to lay out roads and help decide how the land should be reclaimed. Mining engineers use computers to make the mine plan. Experts in transportation decide the best way to move the coal from the mine to the customer. This includes railroads, barges, trucks, and conveyors. As the mining plans are made, a reclamation plan must also be made. When they leave it and it is reclaimed the way the guidelines uh, say that it should be, then the land is more valuable. Hey, go over and look at some of them and see if they're torn up. When they get through reclaiming them, they're beautiful and they're usable. The reclamation plan must consider all the ways coal mining may affect the environment. Environmental scientists, such as biologists, study how mining affects plants and animals. They record all vegetation so it can be restored when mining is finished. They also study wildlife so the land can be returned to the way it was before mining. At each step, computers are used to measure the results and provide information to the scientists. It is necessary for the computer to be up at all times as we are a 24-hour-a-day installation. We have researchers who run experiments that run around the clock and it is necessary for them to be able to gather their data and upload it to the mainframe computer when that data is generated. Government officials work with mine operators to make sure all laws are followed and the local environment is protected. After all the plans are approved and a timetable set, mining can begin. At the surface mine, You'll find all sorts of specialists. Each person has a job and must work with all the other people so the mine is productive and safe. Everything has to work together at a surface mine. One operation depends on the other. You've got starting out with the operation. You start out with topsoil removal, clearing, then you do the drilling and blasting, then you do the stripping of the overburden, and then the coal removal. If one operation falls behind the other, it's staggers all the rest of them, so all the men have to work together. During each shift, there can be many people working at a single surface mine. These include a mine foreman, electricians, mechanics, engineers, radio technicians, and explosive experts, as well as the big equipment operators and blasters. Underground mining requires other experts on each shift. Well, what I enjoy is that I've got guys that's worked for me for 18 years. And we sort of, uh, over the years, have uh, become a family. And to see my guys work, make sure they're safe, 
make sure they're uh, productive, and I just enjoy coming to work. The best known job is that of the miner, but even this job is changing. The guy is more prepared than I was uh, 20 some years ago. When I started, I was taken underground and said, here's a number four coal shovel, uh, shovel from point A to point B. In our case, you gotta have a 40 hour training and you, you go through a new task and hazard training before you even go underground. In the U.S., three-fourths of all coal miners have a high school education or better. The technology has increased on the equipment so that your largest dozers now are very, very expensive machines in excess of uh, $1 million. So if you're going to have a, a fellow or a lady operate that machine, they've got to be very capable. Since underground mining can be dangerous, coal mining has a lot of rules to make it safer. To go into a mine, you must be 18 years old and learn how to use all the basic safety equipment. You have a hard hat, in case you bump your head on the low ceiling, and a miner's lamp with a fully charged battery pack on your belt. You wear steel-toed boots, so if something falls on your foot, you'll be okay. It's a good idea to strap your pant legs so they don't get caught in the machinery. Everyone going underground, even just a visitor, must have a self-rescuer. This is an emergency breathing kit. If needed, everyone knows how to use the self-rescuer so he or she can breathe while getting safely out of the mine. Finally, you have to wear eye protection, either safety glasses or goggles. Coal mining can be dangerous, but by understanding why and how to make it safe for everyone, miners can work safely. Technology is changing how we mine for coal. Underground mining used to be slow and dangerous, but now with machines controlled by computers, it's safer and faster. One example is the continuous miner. The miner controls the continuous miner from many feet away with a remote control. Another safety advance is the roof bolter. Roof bolts are placed in the ceiling by specially trained miners. These keep the ceiling from crashing down on the workers. Shuttle cars move about the mine carrying people and material needed to do the job. Safety features include cabs, lights, and horns. A long wall miner protects the miners by keeping them away from the cutting of the coal and providing roof support. The machine's sensors can feel the floor, walls, and roof so it knows where it is all the time. All these things make underground mining safer for the people who work in coal mines. Surface mining has different machines, and these need highly trained operators. The largest is the drag line. These machines remove the rock that covers the coal and cost millions of dollars. Not just anyone can hop into the seat and operate one of these. Another machine is an auger. It's used in hilly places, such as eastern Kentucky, where a drag line would never fit. It cuts into a coal seam and pulls the coal back, where it can be loaded onto trucks. Other large equipment includes coal shovels, bulldozers, scraper pans, end loaders, and trucks. All require highly trained operators to be productive and safe. Federal and state rules require constant safety inspections, so mine safety inspectors are needed throughout the state and nation. Miners and operators get fines and other penalties if they don't follow the rules. Not everyone in the coal industry works in the mine. Coal is a business, and someone has to run the entire thing and make sure the coal gets to where it needs to be. There are people whose job it is to buy and sell coal. They bring together coal producers and customers. Mining companies need lawyers, accountants, people who buy land and make sure the miners have the latest tools so they can do their job. Each of these jobs requires a lot of education and training to keep Kentucky's coal industry safe and busy. One of the most important things that I feel like that a miner uh, has that uh, he can rely on is his training. We train our miners continuously. We give them weekly safety meetings. We address all topics. We have a work, very good workforce, and I think that's the biggest asset you can have, is a good trained employee makes a good productive employee. Miners must be trained and retrained all the time. They can learn new tasks and make themselves more useful around a mine. 
Someone who only knows one job won't go very far. But those who can drive a shuttle car, operate a continuous miner, and use a computer will always have work in the coal industry. I've got several people that are working for me that's got uh, a college, you know, either two years or four years. Myself, I got an MBA. A unique job at a surface mine is the person who uses explosives, which requires two years of work experience under an experienced blaster and a passing grade on a written test. So you see, basic skills in reading and writing are needed by everyone around an underground or a surface mine. Coal mining is a business, and getting the coal from the mine to the customer is important, no matter where that customer might be. Computers are changing the way railroads operate. Today, automatic loading centers require people who know how to use computers more than ever before. The huge unit trains take a lot of time to learn to operate, and computers are used to control hundreds of thousands of rail cars. The trains are much longer than we've run in the past, and again, you have to know what you're doing to be able to, to do that, to move that train efficiently the way we need it to be run and safely, which is number one on the railroad. As river barges are used more, technology makes them run safer and faster. People who know how to make this happen are more and more valuable. But trucks are still used the most to move Kentucky coal. People who know how to safely operate these big machines will always be needed. You can even own your own truck and carry coal for many mines. This lets you run your own business. Electric utility plants need technicians, engineers, and scientists throughout Kentucky and the United States. And there are just a myriad of jobs in a power plant because power plant has a little bit for, for everyone in terms of what the science and the technology and uh, the aptitudes that are required there. But we have environmentalists that work very hard on the pollution control issues, uh, making sure that the water and the air is protected as well as the operation of our, our transmission and, and electrical distribution system. On the, once the product is made at the plant level, you have to get it out there to the customer, and that just doesn't happen automatically. It takes a lot of technical skill to, to deliver that product to the customer also. These people must be experts in all sorts of areas related to coal and electricity, and they have to know how to use computers. Uh, operator training is a very essential ingredient. Uh, those power plants represent uh, a lot of dollars that's been invested there. And the result of that is that you want the people who are controlling that plant to have a very complete understanding of what the implications, you know, what happens when they push the button, so to speak. Uh, it's very, very critical. We need coal to make electricity. But since burning any fuel can hurt the environment, researchers are looking for ways to make clean burning coal. Scientists from around the world and college students at Kentucky universities are learning more about coal every day. The ultimate aims are to be able to try to enhance the use of coal. The idea is to make those industries more efficient so that they'll grow, they'll employ more people, and they'll continue to produce low-cost electric power, which really benefits us all in, in very many different ways. Highly trained scientists are needed to learn more about coal, but there are other people who help in the research. Not only are there people who are dealing directly with coal, but there are a number of people who are dealing indirectly with coal as well. We have graphics artists who uh, lay the information out in picture form for publication in research journals, as well as even the textbooks used within the schools themselves. And as we learn more about coal, we find other uses never imagined. Coal is a carbon-rich material. It is a natural product. It could serve as a basis for the formation, the uh, production of lots of plastics. And we as a society have come, have come to depend a lot on plastic material. Coal can be used to produce, for example, carbon fibers that can be used in areas like uh, aircraft, spacecraft, uh, sporting goods. Uh, we produce carbons that are very, very porous, like uh, solid sponges, really. And then these materials serve as uh, adsorbers for uh, organic materials and toxic materials that are found in wastewaters, and also in scrubbing of flue gases in power plants. 
As new ways are found to use Kentucky's coal to make electricity and other helpful things, coal becomes more valuable. A lot of people, a lot of researchers are devoting a lot of effort to finding new uses for coal. And this is something that uh, will help the United States in the future because the United States has about a third of all the uh, world's coal reserves. So, where can you fit into the future coal industry? There are many choices ahead of you, but there are also many opportunities. I don't think you're going to be able to get out of high school anymore and go in the mines and, and run a continuous mining. It would be beneficial for a student to be curious, because in being curious, that's one of the major elements in helping you to uh, resolve problems in the research area. The employee we're looking for in the future is primarily one that has uh, a base set of skills that revolve around computer technologies, but we're also looking for people that are good people that can communicate effectively with, with their coworkers. I'll take some engineering classes, take some uh, different types of geography classes, learn to work with different kinds of computer programs, and the more diverse you can be, the better prospects you're going to have of getting a job. There's going to be coal mining contingent as to what the technology is going to be and who is going to operate what kind of equipment, I don't know. But I do know that as long as we continue to use electricity and there's no other means of producing it, there's a tremendous future in coal. Coal is an important part of Kentucky, and we all must know as much as we can about it in order to improve how we use our natural resources and have good jobs in the future. This video showed us the new technologies being used in the coal and electric utility industries. We've also learned what the future might hold for you if you're looking for work in these high-tech industries. So we've come to the end of our journey, and I now hope you have a better understanding of coal, Kentucky's power source. If you want to learn more about Kentucky's power source, check out the companion interactive CD-ROM that you can use on your computer. Travel deep into a mine and find out how the coal got there and how we use it to make electricity, as well as new technologies that are making coal more useful and clean burning. Order your CD-ROM today by calling the number on your screen.